Now let's take our Bibles, lift them, and make this declaration. This is the Bible. It is the Word of God. This book is true, and I believe it. It is filled with hope and promise for my life, now and for eternity. I'm ready to receive what God has from me, from his word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God is good, and all the time, God is good. Amen. Wow, the sun is shining. I actually don't need the gloves, I don't think, this morning. That's, that's a good thing. All right. Let me uh, turn to Romans 15, 13, and some of you are thinking, we're done already? No, we're not done already. I'm turning to Romans 15, 13, because I'm going to use that as our text for this morning's message. This is the first Sunday of Advent. We're talking about hope. Uh, if you saw the YouTube uh, clip, the video of uh, lighting the first candle. During the four weeks of Advent, I like to light the candles. It's the tradition I grew up with. And if we were inside, we'd be lighting the candles and marching, um, measuring our march towards Christmas with those candles. I uh, put it on YouTube this morning. So, or not YouTube. Where was it? Facebook. Someplace on the interweb. Uh, so that you can find it, and we talk a little bit about the Advent season. Uh, Romans fifteen thirteen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we think of uh, different mythologies, Roman mythologies or Greek mythologies, uh, or other ancient cultures, they often have a whole pantheon of gods who have a variety of responsibilities. There might be uh, a god of war, or a fertility god, or a god of peace, or, uh, you know, they have a variety of, of gods. Ancient cultures had uh, this interesting blend of gods. I was reading this week that uh, the Egyptian culture when the uh, Hebrews were slaves in Egypt, had a variety of gods, and they were so tolerant that if somebody had another god that they wanted to worship, that god was just kind of accepted, welcomed on into their collection, their pantheon of gods. Um, and it's interesting when we read the book of Exodus and the plagues that God spoke over Egypt through Moses those plagues demonstrated God's power over a variety of the gods that the Egyptians worshipped. From the very first plague of the, of the Nile River turning to blood, well, they worshipped the river god. And then, of course, they worshipped the sun god. And so one of the plagues was the sky turned black. The day, the day turned black. It was darkened, and the sun was blotted out, demonstrating God's power over their various gods. Interesting, in Jonah's story, when he's on the ship trying to get away from his assignment to Nineveh, and the storm comes up, and, uh, and the sailors finally ask Jonah, oh, after they've cast lots to determine that it was his fault for the storm, they say, who are you and what are you about? And, and he says, well, I'm a servant of the Most High God, the God who made the heaven and the earth. And at that, the sailors trembled. They had their regional gods, their local gods, their uh, various gods that they worshipped. But here was a guy who ticked off the ultimate god. And they were on the same boat with him. And that troubled them. Uh, interesting, they had this variety of gods. And how God, over and over in, in history, demonstrates his power over the false gods worshipped by a variety of cultures. Well, as we look at Romans 15, 13, I want to draw your attention to a few key ideas We're all concerning hope. And first of all, hope has one source. The true and living God is the God of hope. There were local gods that were worshipped 
false gods that were worshipped, who might have been the god of agriculture or the god of water or the god of storms or the god. And God identifies himself, at least in Romans 15, 13, as the god of hope. He's the god of hope. He's the one, the one true God, who is the source of hope. And he has a good track record. He has demonstrated that he, he is faithful and true. He's been involved in human history for a long recorded time. By the time this is written in Romans for us, he's been faithful. He's kept his word. He's kept his promise. He's been good and loving. He's demonstrated that over and over. And we have a hopeful future on earth and in heaven because of this God of hope. He comes to bring us hope now and for eternity. In Jeremiah 29, 11, speaking to people who were in exile, people who had been dragged away from their home in Jerusalem, were in uh, Babylon, and they were... They were uh, pretty downcast, downhearted, because they've been dragged away from home. They're prisoners. They're exiles, uh, not able to go back to their homeland. And Jeremiah wants to remind them that God has plans for them, plans of a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. And it was 70 years of exile, but the people were allowed to return. They came back and they rebuilt Jerusalem. Those plans were played out in their existence. In our memory verse for the, for the month, we have hope for a future. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That's great hope. I've known people who thought they didn't have a hope for eternal life. I've talked with people who have said, well, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. I can't get to heaven. They thought that they had committed sins that were beyond God's ability to forgive. They thought that they were bigger, that their sins were bigger than God's ability to forgive. They thought that they were unlovable because of what they had done in the past. But one of the messages of the gospel is, that God loves us no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been. God loves us, and he wants us. He doesn't want us because we're lovable. He loves us, and he wants us because he's God. Because he's God. And he is the one source of hope. He is our source of hope. Secondly, hope comes with two attachments, at least, according to this verse and. Romans 15, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. And by the way, those are candles three and four in the Advent wreath. Now, it, I talk about candles. Every year at Christmas time, at this season, our family has put a Christmas wreath, a, an Advent wreath on the table so that at dinner time on each Sunday, we light a candle and then the next candle and on the third Sunday we light the first three candles until on Christmas we light the fifth candle which is the Christ candle. If that's not your tradition, let me encourage you. Uh, you might want to pick it up. Advent wreaths are easy to get or you could just put four candles and then another candle for Christmas Day itself or Christmas Eve, whichever you prefer. Uh, and it helps mark and measure the time as we approach the celebration of Christ's birth. Of course, we're living in the first Advent. No, we're living in the second Advent. We celebrate the first Advent, Jesus coming the first time, which reminds us and gives us hope of his second coming. He's coming again. And with that hope, God says there are joy and peace attached to it. We are, are, we are celebrating something that is not just one little bit or another. There's a lot of pieces, uh, a lot of ingredients in this recipe that God has for us in life. And joy and peace, we'll talk more about those in weeks three and four of Advent. But hope does not travel alone. It is not the only ingredient in the recipe. And 
thirdly, hope is contagious. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope. Overflow with hope. It ought to be contagious. Uh, and we know a little bit about contagions now, right? That's why we're outside. There's a contagion going on. We know we're supposed to wash our hands for at least 20 seconds, saying happy birthday or the doxology or you know something that takes at least 20 seconds. Wash your hands with soap. Use sanitizer on a regular basis. Wear a mask when you're close to people. Stay away from people, which is a tough thing to do. Social distancing. We know how to minimize the spread of a contagious disease. We've been told these are things that limit the spread. Wearing the mask, social distance, hand washing, things like that. But we, as the followers of Jesus, ought to be thinking about how do we maximize the contagion of hope in our lives? How do we make that overflow more so in our lives? Uh, may it be that when people bump into us, what spills from our life is hope. All too often, what spills from us when we get bumped is something less than hope. And I, and I know I'm guilty. I, I've gotten bumped by stuff in life, sometimes by people, and the first thing out of my mouth was not an expression of hope. It was more of, more negative than that. And, and God says that we should be so filled with hope that we overflow with it. And you know what it's like when you fill the glass to the brim. It's right up to the top. <laughs> you go, oops, should have stopped a little sooner. And it's hard to move because any little jiggle and it spills over. What causes you to be jiggled in life, bumped? And what spills from your life? Let it be hope. Let it be hope. Let me, uh, let me challenge us with a few questions. Have you been putting your hope in a source other than God? Think about that. Have you been putting your hope in some source other than God? We just got through an election season. Well, we're getting through. I don't know if we're through it yet. But Lansing and Washington, those aren't the source of our hope. No matter which way it goes. Those are lousy substitutes for a source of hope. Compared to God, God's our source of hope. And let me also say that Glock and Smith & Wesson are also lousy substitutes for a source of hope or ourselves, or Wall Street. Boy, if I put my hope in myself, or if I put my hope in Wall Street, or in anything other than God, I'm going to be disappointed. But interestingly, in Romans 5, 5, God says, hope does not disappoint. Hope does not disappoint. Because he has poured out his love into our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hope does not disappoint when we hope in God. Let me ask another question. Have you isolated God's blessings as if you can only experience them one at a time? Well, today I'm going to focus on hope. I'm going to let joy and peace come another time, but today I'm going to focus on hope. No, it's a package deal. They're strung together. They're knit together. When we have hope, we also experience joy and peace. They're meant to travel together. God designed them that way. It is God's design that we are not limited in our experience of hope, joy, and peace and a number of other virtues and blessings that come from God. So if you've pigeonholed or isolated some of the things that God, the blessings that God has designed for us, you don't have to. You don't have to minimize God's grace. Maximize it. Receive it all. And the third question I'd like to ask, are you so full of hope that any time you get bumped in life, hope is what spills out? Is that what people...
people around you notice when things rattle you a little bit. And, and things rattle us. Things happen. Uh, life happens a lot. And when it does, what do people see spilling from our lives? Christmas is a great time to renew and express the hope that we have in God. If you feel like your hope has been just worn out, and 2020 has, has done a lot to wear us out, and you feel like, oh man, it's time to be renewed in hope, then today, that's what God wants to do for you. He wants to restore your hope. Not because the election has passed, I think. I mean, that restores relief for me. No more political ads. But my hope is in God. My hope is way beyond this culture, this life, this time. My hope is in God. Let us be restored. Let us be renewed in our hope. Perhaps you're looking at something in the near future and you're saying, I just, I just don't know how that's going to go. It's overwhelming just thinking about it. I've been thinking about Mark Stender and how he went through chemo, pretty intense chemotherapy this summer. And then they got on the road to head south, gets, in, gets to Arizona and thinks he's having a heart attack because he was having a heart attack. Gets to the hospital, they end up doing a triple bypass. Now, for those of you who don't know Mark Stender well or well enough to realize where he's been, here's a guy who's been a marathoner. He gets out, he hasn't gone running for a month, and he says, well, I think I'll go do a five-mile run. Or maybe I'll get in 10. He's that kind of guy uh, physically, and yet, for whatever reason, his arteries get clogged, and, and this is not his first heart episode. And I think that could be pretty deflating. I look at him, and I'm, and I'm feeling the deflation. It's not my heart, not my arteries. I've been praying for Mark, and thank you for those of you who've been praying. I know it went down the prayer chain, and, and uh, a number of people were praying. And they're grateful for that. But what's been happening in your life? Maybe it hasn't been a heart attack. Maybe it hasn't been surgery. But something's going on. And, or maybe there's something you're facing. And you're having a hard time being hopeful. Know this. The God of hope is watching over you right now. The God of hope knows exactly what you're facing. Where, where you've been and where you're going. And the God of hope wants to give you joy and peace as he pours into your life fresh blessing and anointing this day. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that you are our source, our source of hope, our source of all of life. We trust you and we need you. And Lord, in this place, we're asking you to help us to overflow with hope. We want to receive all of what you have. We want to know you and make you known. And as we look forward to Christmas, as we anticipate celebrating the birth of Christ, this season of Advent is a time for us to renew our relationship with you, renew our reservoir of hope. Lord, hear the prayers of your people as we name those things which feel like are stealing hope and joy and peace from us now. And church, go ahead and name those things before the Lord. Name those things that are frustrating you. Name those things that are irritating you. Name those things that are robbing you of hope. Hear the prayers of your people, Lord, as we name these things before you. We know that you are bigger than any of those things. You are our source of hope. 
and you never fail. We trust you. We believe you. We receive the grace you have for us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now, let's say it together. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless. Have a great day.